Good afternoon. This is Elise Gross with the Presser Law Firm. Welcome to today's webinar. During the course of the webinar, if you have any questions, please email them to info at assetprotectionattorneys.com. And if you're not already receiving our weekly e-newsletter, please also email us or feel free to call the office. In addition to those, we are always available to do complimentary preliminary consultations. So if you have any issues with or questions with anything asset protection or estate planning wise, please give our office a call and we can set up a call with one of our attorneys. And if you have a group of people who are interested in listening to any sort of speech on asset protection or estate planning, please also let us know because we can set up someone, one of our qualified attorneys to come and speak potentially. So please, if anything interests you in any of the things I just said, please make sure to call in or contact the office. I've been an attorney in South Florida for over 25 years. My practice is in asset protection and estate planning and probate. I'm also an adjunct professor at Florida Atlantic University, where I teach in the paralegal program, Wills, Trusts, and Estates. Today's webinar is going to concentrate on international asset protection planning. Now, we're going to go through – sorry about that, a little bit of a technical – Okay, we're going to go through domestic planning versus international planning, the benefits of an international plan. We'll talk specifically about international trusts and international LLCs. We'll touch on what a protector is and what the protector's role is in international planning. We'll go through some of the jurisdictions and how they differ and the benefits. And we'll talk about the process itself for international because it is different than a domestic process. We'll touch upon compliance and taxes and finish off with the ethics, which is always a big question that people have. So what are the benefits of international asset protection? So the benefits of international asset protection are it, and we're going to go into this in a little further detail later on, but if you have international protection, it's very difficult for a U.S. creditor to reach whatever you have internationally. Now, whatever you have, the best way to handle it is to actually have it outside of the United States, physically located, or if it's a bank account, have the bank account outside of the United States. There's definitely asset protection if you have an international component that has assets even in the United States, but it is less protection. The United States doesn't have any jurisdiction over the international entities, and therefore that's a major part of the protection. And then obviously, if a creditor who gets a judgment against you has to go after those assets outside of the United States, after they've now gone through this lawsuit, they're gonna have a major issue with um, the, the cost and the time and who's involved in doing that, uh, doing that uh, process to pursue the assets that the judgment debtor has outside of the country. Okay, so what's the difference between domestic protection and international protection? So today's webinar is going to be about international, so I'm only going to touch briefly on the domestic, but I just want you to get an idea of how they differ and why international protection is better and how it might benefit you, even though it's not for everyone. So a domestic plan is basically one that is inside the United States. So, for instance, that might be a combination of limited liability companies, uh, certain asset protection trusts, could even be part of irrevocable estate planning trusts. It might be owning assets in a jurisdiction where a husband and wife can own what we call tenants by the entireties. It may be holding assets inside exempt assets. So, for instance, it might be in a state where 
Retirement assets, ERISA qualified plans are completely protected and excluded from creditors reach. It might be that, or it could be homestead in a state like Florida or Texas where we have the ultimate homestead protection. So inside the United States, you can use any one or all or a combination thereof of those types of holdings to have your assets. And we would consider that domestic protection. And depending on what it is, meaning what type of asset it is and how it's titled would be really the degree of that asset protection. So certain things, if they're already exempt under federal exemption laws, then those are probably going to be a little bit higher than, say, um, an asset that's just in an LLC. But again, it's going to depend on how the LLC is set up, where the LLC is set up, the agreement for the LLC and the important clauses that are in there, and who actually owns the LLC. So again, that's kind of beyond the scope of today's discussion, but I wanted to just give you an idea of what that would mean. When you go outside of the United States in what we call international asset protection, you're dealing mostly with limited liability companies or the equivalent thereof and different names for those types of entities and certain trusts. You can do both domestic and international. It's really gonna depend on what your assets are, what your availability and ability is to title certain assets and what your level of desire for protection is. And it's gonna come down probably to cost as well because obviously international protection is going to be more costly than domestic protection. So the first thing I wanna go into with regard to international planning is going to be the international trust. Now, what's interesting is that an international trust can technically be irrevocable, meaning one that you can't particularly change, or it can be revocable in which the settlor, the person creating the trust might be able to make a change. If you want the ultimate protection, you're going to go with an irrevocable trust. Now, I have seen some revocable international trusts, but many times we see those with clients who are actually not U.S. clients. So they might be a non-U.S. client who has a revocable trust in another jurisdiction. It's not really desirable from an asset protection standpoint. So we usually would not do something of that nature, but sometimes we have clients who come to us and already have these existing trusts that are revocable and we have to work with them and decide whether or not we should make them irrevocable, change their jurisdiction, create a whole new trust to begin with. A lot of it is gonna come down to what they were trying to accomplish at the time. But in general, what I'd like to talk to you about is the irrevocable trust. Now, when you do an irrevocable trust, generally changes cannot be made by the set law. But if you build in certain abilities within the trust for other people, maybe a trustee, maybe a trust protector, then certain changes might be able to be made even though it's considered irrevocable. And from a tax standpoint, it's going to depend on what your ultimate goal is from an estate and gift tax perspective as to whether or not you want it to be considered whatever you put in there to be considered what we call a completed gift. So just to briefly touch on that, that means in very simple terms, if I create an irrevocable trust and I transfer assets into that trust and I have beneficiaries of that trust, generally that would be considered what we call a completed gift, meaning I transferred it out and now I may or may not have to pay a gift tax on that. However, if you do a asset protection trust, generally it's considered an incomplete gift because you're setting it up really majority for your benefit, meaning the settlor is also the beneficiary, meaning it can't be a completed gift because you can't gift to yourself. So when we sit down with a client, a lot of the times we have to determine 
whether or not the client is intending to get that money back. So most clients, when they set up the international trust, are going to set them up as irrevocable trusts, but not set them up as completed gifts because they are transferring the assets there with the expectation that they would be able to benefit from the trust. So where is the asset protection if a client is able to benefit from the trust? So it comes in many forms. So number one, it's in the fact that the trustee is absolutely not going to be the client. The trustee should never be an individual. The trustee should never be a U.S.-based anything, whether it's an individual or a corporate trustee or bank. It should be an international trustee, meaning an international company that's set up as a trust company, and they should be in total control of the trust. With that said, I'm going to tell you where there's a limitation in their control. We get to the trust protector in a little bit. So you'll need an institutional trustee. That's the first level of defense. Now, the trust is considered what we call a self settled, meaning you set it up, the settler sets it up for self spendthrift trust, which means that there's provisions all throughout the trust document, which by the way, are usually somewhere between 70 and 100 pages, where there are provisions in there that give the trustee discretion as to whether or not to make distributions under the trust. That's what spendthrift is all about. It's discretionary. So it's a discretionary spendthrift settled trust. And there's where your protections lie. Your settlor, the person who created the trust, doesn't have direct access to any of the assets of the trust. They are only a discretionary beneficiary. Therefore, if they make a request of the trustee for a distribution, the trustee is absolutely within their right to say no and refuse the distribution. There might be other beneficiaries or potential beneficiaries under the trust, might be the settlor's children, other family members, whomever the, or it could be the settlor's revocable trust or another trust, all could be permissible beneficiaries. But again, every one of those beneficiaries is only a discretionary beneficiary by the discretion of the trustee, which means if I set up this trust and I put money into it, I fund it, and I make a request to the trustee with what we call a letter of wishes saying, hi, I'm the settlor of this trust and I would like to get a distribution of $100,000. The trustee will analyze your request will probably ask some additional questions, including what is your situation right now? Are you involved in any lawsuits? Is there any pending litigation? How's your marriage? Are there any threats against you? The trustee can then determine whether or not to make a discretionary distribution. And if the trustee says no, that's it. So obviously, that's something of concern when a client is setting up an international trust, one of these irrevocable trusts, they're always concerned, well, wait a minute, what happens if the trustee says no, if they have such discretion? Well, the thing you have to understand is that the trustee is a fiduciary, which means they have an obligation under the trust to do what's best for the beneficiaries. So if there's no reason that a distribution shouldn't be made, then it's highly likely the trustee is going to make that distribution. Obviously, there's no guarantee, but most of the times the trustee is going to make the distribution. If we were to give the trustee a requirement, make it a mandatory distribution, then we would not be accomplishing the protection that we want to put in place. If a trustee can be forced because the document requires it, to make a distribution, then if a judge requires somebody to ask for a distribution, the trustee would have to give it to them and you'd really lose any protection. 
So if you're going to do international planning, you're going to have to have a leap of faith in your trustee, which incidentally, you as the settlor are not able to change the trustee. That's where the trust protector is going to come in. And we'll talk about that further down the road. So you're setting up the irrevocable trust. You're setting it up in a jurisdiction outside of the United States. You're transferring assets into the trust and you are presumably a discretionary beneficiary of the trust, either on your own or with others that you've selected. You also would put in there provisions as to what happens if you die. There's this trust out there. Where's the trust going to go? Is the trust going to continue for the other beneficiaries? Is the trust going to pour into some sort of domestic estate plan that you have, whether it's a revocable trust or something, some other type of plan? Those all have to be included within the trust document. Bottom line is the trust is the most protective entity you can get outside of the United States. And we'll be talking about the dis different uh, jurisdictions that we can use for trusts and how we the interplay between trusts and the LLCs. But outside of the US, you can't get better than the international trust. They're tried and true. They've been around for a very, very long time. And depending on the jurisdiction, how long they've been around, there's a lot of case law on it. And fewer than 1%, I believe, are the statistics of trusts have ever even been challenged, much less reached by a creditor. So now let's talk about the LLC, because the LLC is used for different things, at least the way we set them up. You do an international LLC if you want to protect assets outside the United States, either they could be personal assets, but where we most see them is, let's say you have a company within the United States and that company keeps a lot of cash on hand, a lot of liquid that they might need one day, but don't necessarily need it today. Well, if that company gets a judgment against them, the creditor can just go into their bank account and take those assets and take that cash. So what we do is we can set up an LLC that's actually a subsidiary of the main company. So the U.S. company owns this LLC outside of the U.S. And that LLC, that subsidiary, would set up a bank account outside the U.S. And the company can send its excess cash over to that bank account it's still an asset of the company. It's still on the books because the subsidiary LLC is owned by the main company. But to reach it, the, the creditor would have to go through pretty much the same that they would have to go through to sue an international trust. And we're going to get into that. So that's one thing we use international LLCs for. It can also, and again, this is you know a level of protection that you know a client has to decide if they're willing to go through this because there's definitely some complexity on the next one which is the accounts receivable if you have a high level of accounts receivable well that's an asset of your company so if you have a US company with a high AR that is also an asset that is reachable by a creditor should they get a judgment against the company so you can set up an LLC and have a system in which the, the international LLC holds the AR and all those funds go through that international LLC and therefore only fund your domestic company when needed. That's a more of a hands-on approach, meaning you're gonna have to deal on a consistent basis with the manager, the LLC manager. So, that is something that is definitely a good business play, but sometimes, you know, it could be costly to maintain that entity where you're doing a, a lot of transactions between the U.S. and the international entity. So in that one, it's going to depend on who's the manager.
And the manager is the one who controls the LLC. If you do an international company as a manager, meaning a professional international manager, then that's where you're going to gain the most protection because then you don't have a U.S.-based individual who has technical control over the LLC, and it'll be a lot harder for anyone, any judgment creditor or a U.S. judge to get at that LLC. If you as a U.S. person insist upon being the manager, that is possible. You would just have an international company as the registered agent to serve in whatever jurisdiction the LLC is set up in. And you would have to have in the, in the international LLC's operating agreement some sort of clauses that trigger your being removed as a manager in the event of a duress situation. You never want to be before a judge in the United States where there's a judgment creditor standing there waiting to get paid and you will not want to be the person who can control that international LLC. Because if you do, then the judge will order you to bring those funds back to domesticate them and pay the creditor. So there has to be some sort of provision in the operating agreement for the underlying, for the international LLC that has a trigger that says if the manager is under duress, the manager is suspended from duties as manager and the international manager takes over immediately. And depending on what you put in, what that trigger should be, it may be, let's say the company is being sued, you may be removed at that point as a manager. It just depends on what provisions are directly put into the operating agreement. The beauty of an LLC is you can build the operating agreement to say what you want it to say, and base, that's from a domestic or international. And as long as it doesn't counteract the actual jurisdiction's law, you can stretch things as much as you need to. So that's where we stand in terms of who can control that LLC. So it's better if it's an international manager from the beginning. But if a client is going to insist on having some sort of control, then the client can be the manager, but there has to be a trigger that removes the manager in the event of certain duress occurrences. Another option for using that international LLC is if the company actually has international sourced business. So if they're doing work, if they're getting customers outside of the United States, if they're selling products outside of the United States, they can potentially set up either a completely separate company having nothing to do with the, with the domestic operating company, or they can set up a subsidiary, but that would be for any business that's happening internationally. So that money may never ever hit the United States. And those are things that you can do with the LLC. Now, you can also combine the LLC and the trust so that the LLC and the trust can be used together where you might have a trust set up by a settlor and then you have an LLC owned by the trust and the assets are actually in the LLC. You would have potentially different jurisdictions for the trust and the LLC. The client could potentially be the manager of the LLC with that trigger clause. And then you have so many jurisdictions going that a creditor wouldn't even know where to turn to to try to sue, to try to get any of the assets inside any of the entities, whether it's the LLC or the trust. One thing I didn't touch upon, and it's really the cornerstone of asset protection, and one of the things we're always trying to protect against, is the concept of the fraudulent transfer. A fraudulent transfer is basically when someone, a debtor, transfers assets outside of the debtor's name for the purpose of not paying a creditor. That is a very general definition. 
There are many nuances to it. There are many things that we have to look at. When was the debt incurred? Was it, is there a judgment? Is it pre-judgment? And then who made the transfer? Was there consideration for the transfer? Was money exchanged for the transfer? Was it a fair value that was exchanged for the transfer? Who was the transferee? Meaning where did the asset go that was transferred out? Was it transferred to um, a company that the that the credit that the debtor owned? Was it transferred to a relative? And then most importantly, the thing that's looked at is intent. What was the intent behind the transfer? Was the intent to hinder or delay a creditor from getting paid? So all those things are looked at when you are brought in front of a judge, wherever it is, whether it's in a domestic court or outside the U.S. court, to determine whether or not a fraudulent transfer was made. And every jurisdiction is going to have their own rules as to what they look at. And then in addition to the statutory rules, they also look at case law. What have other judges in that jurisdiction or similar jurisdictions evaluated under similar circumstances to determine whether or not something was a fraudulent transfer? So that is really a cornerstone of asset protection. So when we start getting into the jurisdictions and stuff, you'll see where that's a very big part of determining where you should set up your international entities and how long a creditor has to actually pursue the debtor to collect. I mentioned a few times about the concept of a protector. A protector can be an individual or a company that has certain powers under a trust or an LLC. Their role is to serve as essentially the eyes and ears of either the settlor, meaning if they set up a trust, or the LLC, the eyes and ears of the ultimate owners or person who governs the company that owns the LLC or the individual that owns the LLC. So in a trust, the settlor really can't do much after they set up the trust in terms of control. They can have a veto power in terms of distribution so that if any beneficiary requests a distribution, they can veto it. They can change the protector. They can request a distribution as a beneficiary, but it's the protector who has to sign off on stuff. It's the protector that would have the benefit of being able to change the trustee. So if the settlor is not really happy with the trustee, the settlor can't change the trustee. The settlor reaches out to the protector and says, change the trustee. So a protector can change the trustee. A protector would also sign off on distributions. A protector would sign off on any potential amendments to the trust, assuming that the trust gives ability to amend, whether it's for changes in tax law, for Scrivener's errors, for um, administrative provisions that can be changed. There's usually provisions in the trust that, and with LLCs, that allow the document to be changed to a certain extent, but the protector always has to sign off on that. So that protector is a very important role inside international planning. So the question always comes into play as to who should be the protector, who can be the protector. So the settlor should never be the protector because that would eliminate the, some of the protection that you have inside of the international planning. We recommend that the settlor's spouse should not be the protector because they're too close to the protector and it's possible that any creditor might be coming after both husband and wife or that um, a judge can order that it's too close and therefore the protector must obey the judge. You can have a, a relative or someone else inside the US and that's what most people do because they feel the most comfortable. They know if they set something up and they can't make changes, they really want to be comfortable with who's able to make those changes and who can change out the trustee and the LLC manager. And I understand that 
it does make a lot of sense and it adds a lot of comfort to the idea of international protection. However, if you had a protector outside of the United States, it would definitely be taking the protection to a better level. Because if they're outside the United States, we never have to worry about a US court getting any jurisdiction over the, the protector. Because they'll already have jurisdiction over the settlor, but if we have jurisdiction over the protector, you know, we're losing a little bit of protection there. The good news is a properly drafted document is going to build in a protection that if the creditor, I'm sorry, if the protector comes under duress, then the protector will be removed as a protector and an, another protector can be put into place. There might be internally in the document already a provision to who the successor protector is. If not, there's a provision that the international trustee would be able to choose a new protector or in an LLC that the international manager would be able to choose another protector. So there are always safeguards if it's done properly built in, but if you don't have the US protector in the first place, then you don't even have to cross that bridge. And then again, since that protector is really a pivotal role, you as the settlor, you as the, the controller of the domestic company that owns an LLC, you get to change the protector, but you can never pick yourself because that would really negate a lot of the asset protection that we're dealing with. Now let's talk about where you might want to consider setting up your international protection. So I've got three jurisdictions that are really the most popular and the best. Combined, they have the best laws and they're really kind of neck and neck. One might be better in some areas and the other, you know, but they're, they're really all on the same level. And that would be Belize, Cook Islands, and Nevis. Belize and Nevis are not very far away from the United States. Cook Islands is very far from the United States. Now, do most people visit the jurisdiction that they set their entities up in, whether it's a trust or an LLC? Probably not, but there are some people that feel more confident knowing that they could if they wanted to. Most people really just want to visit the money that they use to fund these entities, and we'll talk about that too, about where you would actually do your banking, because you're not necessarily going to do your banking where you set up the entity. So here's a couple of things to look at. So number one, you always want to look at, you know, what's the statute of limitations on bringing a fraudulent transfer claim inside these jurisdictions? Because regardless of where the assets are, these jurisdictions are going to be the governing law of the trust or the LLC. So in, um, so the fraudulent transfer in Cook Islands and Nevis is either two years from the underlying cause or one year from the date the U.S. suit was brought. So the reality of the situation is U.S. court system and the process is so slow that by the time you bring it, the judgment, the U.S. judgment to another jurisdiction to either um, Cook Islands or Nevis and Belize has two years straight across. By the time you bring it there, it's time barred anyway. So more than likely, it'll never get off the ground. Now, there could be an instance where, you know, there was a default and it moved pretty quickly through the U.S. court system. And then you are within your time frame to be able to file in either Belize, Cook Islands or Nevis to say that assets were transferred fraudulently and now you want to get the creditor wants to get them back, but chances are pretty low that you'll actually be within that time frame. But let's just say you are. Well, in the Cook Islands and Nevis, you need to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the fraudulent transfer actually occurred. That's the same standard as we have in the US to prove that somebody is guilty of murder. It's an extremely high standard. 
So even if you're within the period of time where you can bring an action inside the jurisdiction internationally to prove a fraudulent transfer so that you could attempt to get a judgment within that jurisdiction to try to go after the assets beyond a reasonable doubt. Then none of these jurisdictions even recognize US judgments in the first place. So now you got to relitigate the whole thing inside Belize or Cook Islands or Nevis. So you're going to be suing again. So now you have to hire counsel in that jurisdiction. It may require your U.S. counsel to be part of the team. So now you're flying that U.S. counsel. You're paying both attorneys to deal with it. And depending on what jurisdiction you're in, they may not take case. They usually don't take the case on contingency. So you're paying hourly. And then, depending on what jurisdiction you're in, even if you win the new the new lawsuit, if you win it, let's say you relitigated the entire case, there may not even be any punitive damages. You may just be entitled to a straight award of you know co compensating for whatever the actual damages are. So you're severely deterred if you're a creditor from going after any entity set up in any of those jurisdictions. In addition, Nevis has a requirement where a creditor in order to sue inside Nevis, they have to post a bond. And the bond used to be smaller than it went up to $100,000. And now it's actually judicial discretion. So it could even be higher where the Nevis court could decide based on the case if they want to require a higher bond. So the creditor who has a judgment against you in the U.S., who's just been through this whole litigation, who's now ready to go after you outside of the U.S., may have to relitigate the whole case, pay double attorneys to do it, maybe time bar to even do it, and would have to put up a bond if it's a Nevis to even attempt to sue. In addition, Belize and Nevis don't even allow asset freeze orders. So who knows where your assets are at that point? Because of course you're gonna have inside your agreements that the situs, not only can the situs of the trust or LLC be changed, the governing law, you can move it to another country, but you can, the trustee or the manager at any point can move the money. So if by some chance you had the money inside Belize, Cook Islands or Nevis, which most of the time you wouldn't except maybe in the Cook Islands, you could move the money. So by the time they got their judgment inside this new country, the money wouldn't even be there. So now they're going to have to go relitigate and pursue it in another country. So they'll be chasing their tail to get anything out of this. So which is the best jurisdiction? There's really no true answer to that. Nevis has improved. Cook Islands has been around for the longest time. Their trust law is is very concrete. Nevis has moved their laws into a, a pretty good position, but they don't have much case law. And Belize, which arguably may have the best law as a whole, also is pretty new to the game and doesn't have much case law. However, all of them have great law and you're not leaving your money for the most part in any one of those jurisdictions. So you're really safe with any one of those three jurisdictions. Now, you've probably all heard about the Cayman Islands and the Bahamas and, you know, Turks and Caicos and some, you know, other jurisdictions. They're not as good. Um, they're not as protective from an, a creditor perspective. They do allow for secrecy, but that's not what this is all about. Asset protection planning is about legally and ethically protecting your, your assets from creditors. It's not about hiding anything. So secrecy is really not going to be the main focus of your international asset protection. So how does this all work? We want to set up a trust. We want to set up an LLC. Can we just call up and get it done? And the answer is no. There's a very 
thorough process that you have to go through in order to set up an international entity. And if you're thinking that, oh, I can go online and somebody will do it for a few thousand bucks and it'll, it'll be up and running in a few days, it's a nice thought. But if that's going to happen, chances are it's not being done the way it's supposed to be done. There's a regulatory process in every jurisdiction as to things that the really they're called a regulator that they look at before an entity can properly be established. They will require passports that are generally certified, meaning you're going to sign in front of a notary that this is your passport. They may require passports of any beneficiary. They're certainly going to require the due diligence from both a settlor for a trust and a protector. And in an LLC, they're going to need it for the protector and for the majority owners of the overlying business. They also require a current utility bill for your residence. So it has to have your name on it and it has to have your residential address on it. And that has to be the mailing address. They have to verify that you are who you are and that you actually have a dwelling and you're not, you know, roaming around the world without, you know, a place to be because that always makes everybody nervous if you don't have a home. So there's going to be due diligence from definitely from the protector, definitely from the settlor, definitely from majority owners of the business. They may require it of any beneficiary. There could be w, IRS W-9 forms that are required of all beneficiaries and of all owners. There might be letters of reference from banks, CPAs, attorneys, or both for people who um, can swear that they knew you for over two years and in what capacity they knew you, which you'd think is easy, but I cannot tell you how many people don't actually have anyone who could write them those reference letters. So it becomes a little bit of a chore sometimes to gather the due diligence. And the reason we do it is that we know if we're doing the due diligence and if the client can come up with the due diligence and we go through this lengthy process and it's tedious, then we know it's being set up correctly. You'll also have to make sure that your CPA is completely on board as a tax planner that they know there are going to be disclosures and returns that need to be filed for the new entities, whether it's a trust or an LLC. And some international trust companies will require the CPA to sign off that they are acknowledging that they have that responsibility. Now, you can use an international CPA, probably can be recommended to you by the trustee, but most people will want to use their U.S.-based CPA because they want to coordinate everything with their personal tax return, especially with a trust, because that might be considered what we call a grantor trust, which means that the settlor is actually declaring the income as their own. So therefore, it gets taxed on their own uh, personal tax return in addition to whatever tax returns need to be filed on behalf of the entity. Once all the due diligence is acquired and there is a time frame to acquire it, could be 60 days, could be 90 days, but everything has to be done. It's kind of a race against the clock because everything has to be current. So if you get a letter of reference and then it takes you, you know, three or four months to get your passport signed off on, then now the letter of reference could be stale or your utility bill is the biggest race because it goes by the earliest date on the utility bill. So you have to kind of be persistent in order to get all the due diligence done so that it's done within the proper framework because if it's not done within that proper timing, then you're not going to be able to get the entity registered. And the entity is monitored by the regulators. The regulators do come in and they check the files of the trustee and they check the files of the LLC manager they need updated passports and updated due diligence every once in a while. So you need to make sure that if you're creating one of these companies, that you have all of these things available. Because we often will run into, sometimes it's a, you pick somebody as your protector and that person doesn't have a utility bill in their own name. Or they didn't bother to have a passport. So now they have to go get a passport. 
and they have to go get a utility bill put in their name. So there's like a lot of planning that's involved in this. And this is all in addition to the actual creation of the document of the LLC operating agreement or the trust agreement. So now let's talk a little bit about compliances and taxes. I'm not a tax professional, so I'm only going to touch upon this. If it's some, if you are going to be creating any sort of international entity, then it's very important that your local tax professional is on board and speaking to the attorney and speaking to the trustees and understanding the forms that will need to be filed and disclosures that need to be filed because there's nothing to be hidden from the IRS. International planning is not about hiding. The IRS will know absolutely everything that you're doing and should know absolutely everything that you're doing. And if you fail to file a required disclosure or a tax return, even if there are no taxes due, there are hefty penalties. So some of the things that might be filed, and it, it's not across the board, might be the 3520 or a 3520A or a 1040 NR. Or you might have to, and sorry, you might have to file um, what we call the FBAR form. And if there's a foreign bank account, then the FinCEN form. Also keep in mind that regulations have changed and now there is reporting that has to be done by any, anyone custodying a U.S. person's assets outside of the United States, which means the trustee, the bank, the LLC manager, they are reporting to the IRS about any assets that you have outside of the United States. There are different thresholds depending on you know, what your tax return says, what income you have. I, it's beyond the scope of my knowledge of, to get into all that, but it's definitely something that needs to be monitored because the last thing you want to do is go through getting an entity set up, funding it, because if it's not funded, it's not doing you any good, um, even though it can be an insurance policy for the future, then forgetting to file any sort of return or disclosure, which will then cost a hefty penalty. The other thing you need to make sure of is that you're always keeping the trustee or LLC manager um, updated with your passports. If your passport gets renewed, just do new certifications. Make sure they always have it. They're usually on top of it to ask for it, but you know, make sure don't let your passport lapse because they're going to need your passport to prove who you are. In addition, you have to make sure that you're always paying the service provider, whether it's the trustee or the LLC manager, that you're in good standing with them. And they usually are the ones that pay the annual registration for both the trust and the LLC. So don't be penny wise and pound foolish and forget to pay those things because there are hefty penalties if you don't do those. And if it's not in good standing, then it may not be able to help you when the time comes, should the time come that it's needed. We didn't really talk much about banking, but if you have an international entity, you're generally going to have a corresponding bank account. You may set up that bank account in a different jurisdiction altogether. So for instance, you may have an a trust that's set up in Belize. There might be a co-trustee in Switzerland and the bank account might be, it could be in Switzerland, it could be in Liechtenstein, in some other jurisdiction other than the trustee. So that way, if a creditor is coming at you, they have to go through so many jurisdictions to actually get at anything. And as I said before, the trustee could then move the money. So, you know, how easy is it for a creditor to get at it? pretty complicated, unless you're the US government and then they have a better shot. And that really depends on the circumstances and, and the governing entity that's, you know, the US uh, government entity that's going after it. But you're gonna want a bank account established. If you establish the bank account, depending on where it's located, there are gonna be minimums that need to be kept in there. And unlike the US, many of these jurisdictions don't pay interest on the account. In fact, they hold the money for you, kind of like 
custodying the money and they charge you for the benefit of you being able to keep your money there. So you're going to want to put enough there so that it can be invested so that you're not actually coming out of pocket each year to pay for the bank account. It's work. It, the money is working for you so that the bank account is being paid for. And generally, just like with anything else, you want to invest the assets because you want the money to be working for you and earning interest. So there are a lot of different options for investing. You just need a registered investment advisor. Generally, it's an international registered investment advisor, but it can be a U.S. one as long as that U.S. one has been approved by the bank you're using. They have a whole onboarding process that they do for each and every um, registered investment advisor that's being used. So you have to make a decision whether or not you want to use the international one or not. The last thing I want to cover is the ethics of international protection. There is nothing unethical about setting anything up outside the United States as long as you're doing it properly and you're not doing it with the intent to hide. Remember that hiding and privacy are completely different. You wouldn't necessarily be able to find somebody's international entity like you might be able to find a U.S. one if you do a search, but that's privacy. That's because I don't want anyone to be able to readily find it. However, I'm going to get a tax ID number for anything we set up outside the United States. The IRS is fully informed that something exists and that filings are going to be necessary. So you need to make sure you use a reputable attorney and that you use a reputable trustee. And as I said earlier, if it's too easy, it's probably not being done right. And you need to always be in compliance with everything that you're doing. If you have a judgment against you inside the United States and a judge then says to you what after assets have been determined, what you had, there was a subpoena in aid of execution of the judgment. The creditor now knows what you have. Because remember, in most cases, they can't ask until you've already got a judgment against you. Now that everybody knows what you have and they know you have this international trust or this international LLC, now they can ask about it. They can ask to see the documents and the creditor can try to pursue making the judge order you to pay them from these international assets. And I've told you that's pretty difficult and they're going to have to go outside the United States in order to get it. So as long as the client or the the debtor is debtor is not in control of those assets, then the U.S. judge is really going to be tied. Other than to say, go rec don't tell the trustee anything. Write a letter to the trustee and request a distribution. And as long as the settlor slash debtor is compliant with that, then there really isn't any way that the judge can hold them in contempt of court because they've been compliant with what the judge has asked. Now the trustee can turn around and say, no, I'm not giving it to them because it's against the trust. And they have to be compliant with their role as trustee. But as long as you've complied, there's generally no way that the judge is going to put you in jail for contempt because you've done what the judge has asked for. Now, the other thing you need to make sure of when you do these international entities is you have to have a good reason for setting it up. Setting it up so that you don't have to pay a creditor, a particular creditor, is not a valid reason. That will often come back and bite you because if you're under oath, you have to ask, you have to answer why you set it up, then it would be a problem. And you obviously always want to do this with legal money. Never, never, never do anything with any money that's questionable. Even if you didn't do anything wrong, but you think the source may have been a questionable source, Never put that money in an international entity because that is a crime and that will come back at you and that money could potentially be seized. And then lastly, never forget to file returns and disclosures. It's critical. If you're not compliant with the IRS, it will cost you in both money, time and reputation potentially. So 
If you're going to do the international, it could definitely be a good thing for you from an asset protection standpoint, but you have to make sure to always do everything properly. If you have any questions on today's webinar, please email us and we'll get back to you. In addition, if you are not getting that newsletter that I mentioned earlier on, please contact us and we'll put you on the newsletter or if you want a complimentary preliminary consultation or copies of our books, or even to set up a speaking engagement, or if you have any ideas on future webinar topics, we're always searching for them. If you're not already following us on social media, please follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. And as for this webinar, replays will be available on YouTube and on our website. I thank you very much for joining us and hope to hear from you with any questions and for you to join us next month on our next webinar. Thank you so much.